Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Senior Ministry and Risk Management Program. This program is the nuts and bolts of your estate plan. This is a wonderful program that the Senior Ministry and the Risk Management has put together to provide you with information. So please take the time to enjoy this wonderful presentation that we're doing for you. I'm gonna start with a little scripture reading for us. It's taken from Ephesians 2, verses eight to 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us. Here ended the reading of God's holy word. Now we'll ask Sister Carmen Guy, head of our risk man management, to now do our prayer. Okay. Dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. And we thank you for every person that has joined us on the line today and those that will be joining us in a few minutes. We thank you, God, for the community that we live and work in. And we ask you this evening to be with Judy and Kadeen, who have offered to share some very inf important information with us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. And we ask you this, Lord, this afternoon to help us to remember, to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I will now turn the program over to our own dear Judy Barthlett, Esquire, who is a longtime resident of Greenberg and also a member. We look forward to her presentation and we look forward to meeting Kadeem L. Wong, Esquire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Hello, everyone. I'm going to call out uh, some names that you may be familiar with. Prince, Jimi Hendrix, Bob Marley, Aretha Franklin, Tupac, James Brown, and Billie Holiday. What do they all have in common? Well, uh, they are all dead. That is true. Uh, they're all African-American, um, they were all phenomenal musicians, and they all died without having a will. This means that everything they owned was declared intestate, and the courts determined how their estates would be divided up. Of course, you know, and we read about the stories and heard about them, this led to inevitable legal battles and a lot of infighting among family members. Don't let this be you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Judy Bartlett, uh, if you just joined, and I'm here today on behalf of the Senior Ministry and Risk Management Departments uh, with another installment of our financial literacy series. I'm being joined today by Kadeen Wong, attorney at law. Uh, she specializes in elder law, special needs, and trust in the states. Her practice includes drafting complex wills and trust agreements, preparing and reviewing estate gift and generation skipping transfer tax returns, estate and trust administration, probate and ancillary probate proceedings and related wealth transfers and charitable planning. Uh, in 2021, Ms. Wong was selected as a super lawyer, New York rising star in the areas of estate planning and probate law. This designation is awarded only to a select number of accomplished attorneys in each state and the selection process takes into account not only peer recognition, but professional achievement in their legal practice and other cogent factors. Uh, she is on the board of the Southern District of New York chapter of the Federal Bar Association and the advisory board of the Pace Women's Justice Center. Uh, Ms. Swang is a graduate of Elizabeth Howe School of Law, formerly known as Pace Law School and Concordia College. Uh, she's written numerous articles and made many presentations on the topic of estate planning. In fact, I had the pleasure of attending one of Ms. Wong's Senior Law Day presentations, I guess it's a couple months ago now, and she was gracious enough to accept our invitation for this afternoon's presentation, The Nuts and Bolts of Your Estate Plan. Um, a few housekeeping items before I turn the screen over to Kadeen, um, because uh, there is a lot to cover today. It's all very well 
thought out and clear, good information. Um, but because of the breadth material we're going to be covering, we'd like to sort of limit questions uh, until the end of the presentations. Uh, and then we will answer as many questions as we can. Thank you very much. Uh, Kadeem? Thank you. It's really wonderful to have the opportunity to speak with you tonight. I'm very excited that the senior ministry and risk management um, team asked me to speak with you tonight. And I think that this is a very important topic. So let's get into it and see you know, how we can really structure our thoughts about our own estate planning documents. And just those terms alone are so huge. So let's break it down into pieces that we can really understand. Because when we're really speaking about your estate planning documents, we're really speaking about your family and the things that you own currently, right? It's, it sounds bigger than it really is. So this part of the presentation is really going to be broken down into six parts. And it's the main component components of your estate planning documents and what happens after you die, the surrogate's court process. So we'll discuss that also. And I've also tacked on at the last screen, just a note about estate taxes, gift taxes, and estate taxes come in two different forms. This is a federal estate tax, and then there is the state estate tax. And for this presentation, we'll be discussing New York estate taxes. So the first part of the presentation will discuss wills. We'll have some definitions and just go through the process of what a will really is and what do you need to create one. And then we'll discuss the surrogate's court process, um, trust, what to include in a will or a trust document, and alternatively, what if you choose not to do a will or a trust? What other planning can you do so that it's easier for your own family members and loved ones to, to have it an easier process access in the, those assets that you really meant to give to them without spending a lot of legal fees and, you know, back and forth. And uh, for number six, we'll discuss the financial and healthcare directives. And as I mentioned, we'll have a note about um, a note about the estate taxes. So part one wills. We'll discuss definitions. What is a will, reasons to have a will, and dying without a will. So here, the surrogate's court, excuse me. The surrogate's court in New York, this court decide what happens to a person's property when the person dies, right? We're not going to go to criminal court. The Supreme Court also has jurisdiction, but for, first stop, for the first stop, we're going to the surrogate's court and they have the jurisdiction. The Probate refers to the proceeding, probate and administration refers to the proceeding that is brought in surrogate's court when someone um, dies. And decedent, decedent refers to the person that have died. They're now called the decedent. Uh, estate, a decedent's Estate really refers to all the rights, the titles, the interest in each property that is left behind. These are called the probate assets. And the reason why I use the word probate assets is because these are the assets that the court will have its hands on. These are the assets that the court is going to overlook to make sure that everything is done accordingly to, um, to your will or to law, right? And 
the next thing, the next asset that's involved is non-probate assets. Those are assets that say, for example, like a bank account that you titled in your name, but also the name of your spouse. Those assets are called non-probate assets. They do not go through your will. They do not go through the court. They instead go directly to the beneficiary that you have named on that bank account to receive those assets. And the next is testate. When a person dies and leaves behind a will, intestate refers to when a person dies without a will. And these terms refers to executor, administrator, personal representative, and fiduciary, really refers to the people that you appointed, you have nominated, and the court has appointed to wrap up your estate, to handle all your assets, and to pass them along. Either they're passing it along because your will stated where those assets go, or you're passing it along as the law dictates. And we'll get into that a little bit later. And real property. I'm segregating real property um, versus personal property because in the law, it really matters. Real property refers to land in any structure permanently affixed. And you know, examples are like your home and the land surrounding it. And personal property, there are two types of personal property. Uh, this includes jewelry, cash, furniture, things that you can actually touch are tangible. So these are referred to as your tangible personal property. But you also have assets that are like bank accounts, bonds, stocks, and these are referred to as your intangible assets, right? Yes, once we go in and we pull out, you know, we sell the stock or we pull out the assets from the bank account, then they become tangible. But right now they're in an intangible form. And non-probate assets, as that's the last um, on the screen, not last definition, the non-probate assets, these are just assets um, jointly held with someone else, as I mentioned, or assets that you have told the bank or the stock um, the stock investment company that you're working with, where that asset should go when you die. And those designation form completely control over any will or other trust documents that you would meet. For what, what I'm really saying could be summed up in this example. If in my will, I said, give this $100,000 to my sister, but really with Chase, I have an account and on the account it says my name, Katie L. Wong. And once I die, it's joined with my brother, it goes straight to him, right? So in that case, what my will says, give to my sister. Now my bank account says, give to my brother, which controls my brother gets those assets. So it's very important. And this term, distributee, if you type it into your, um, excuse me, if you type the word distributee into Word doc, it's going to come up as wrong. Um, you'll get a wrong spelling, but it's a legal term of art and it has all these meanings behind it. And distributees are the family members who are entitled to a share of the decedent's estate um, when there is no will. These are the beneficiaries that takes above everyone else. And it in includes your spouse, your children, your grandparents, um, your uncles, your aunts, your um, cousins. And we're talking from both sides of the family, right? Mom and dad. And for beneficiary now, where is the beneficiary is different from your spouse and from your children and your lineal descendants, like your grandparents and onwards, right? Beneficiaries are those other people, um, your neighbor, Jane, right? Your pastor, 
Um, maybe you had a fund for maybe a charitable organization. These people are the beneficiaries that are inheriting on your estate, under your estate, but the distributees are those people that are like your relatives. And then because we'll be discussing what a trust is and what really goes into a trust, we'll be discussing grantor, a settler, and a grantor is basically the same thing. It all means the person who created a trust and funded that trust with assets. And then we'll get into a trustee, right? This is the person that is going to be in charge of the trust. And that person could be you yourself who's setting up the trust. Or if it's just not something you want to have the day-to-day -day burden of, and may think that your assets would be better handled with someone with more knowledge, then you can appoint someone else. The, the usual way of you know, planning is that you develop a um, create a, a revocable trust, which we'll get into later, and you name a trustee for that trust, and you name yourself as the first person. So while you're living, you have control over your assets, you have control over what goes in, what comes out, um, and you have control over who gets it and in how much in what portions, right? So you have full control here in a revocable trust. But you could also name someone as a secondary person, a successor trustee. So you could be very creative with this. So when you see the word trustee, think of yourself and others that are responsible people who are gonna do um, what you have stated that they should do in that trust instrument, right? And then the trust assets, and that just refers to property that was placed in the trust. And um, not to get too complicated, but the assets are bifurcated into two parts. Um, when you refer to a trust asset or a trust fund, you're really thinking about income and you're thinking about principal of the trust and the principle of the trust is the assets that you originally placed into the house i mean into the trust for example like a house or other um, maybe business assets that you placed in the trust and they're gaining interest over time so that interest could be income that your funds generated so you could take those income and you could give it to your beneficiary you could give it to yourself but the original fund, maybe the $100,000 that you placed in the trust, maybe you don't want to trust that. You don't want to touch that right now. You just want to keep it in the trust. And that would be called the principal or the corpus, right, that funded the trust. So when you think trust assets, there are two different um, ways of looking to that income and the corpus property. So let's get into what is a will. So a will is a written document first and must be in writing. And there are other, um, you know, there's other states that would accept like a verbal will and different things. But for now, we're sticking to what's in the green book, right? And to, by law, a will is a written document and it's legally binding and it helps to protect your loved ones. And a will basically, basically spells out exactly how you would like your assets in your estate handled and to whom you would like those assets to go to upon passing. At least one executor will be appointed in your will. And you really, really wanna think about who you want to, um, to appoint to be responsible for managing your estate to its conclusion. You really don't want to choose someone who's gonna really sit around and not like get things done. Because eventually when you go down the line and maybe a grandchild has the family home now and they need to do something specific, right? And now there it's like title that goes back to great, great grandma. And now we have to clear up all that title. It's a lot of work and a lot of money, right? So you just want to name someone who can really handles handle all the ins and outs and who you choose is your choice right just someone reliable and trustworthy as we discuss 
and the a will really requires the execution of a two witnesses and at least a notary and your will could be changed at any time before you die um, as quickly as you change it, you change your mind for example um, you had no children when you made your will but it's important that you know you address that that because now you have a child and now you may have grandchildren and so you really want to um, update your will as frequently as your circumstances change. I just I think I'm in the right place. Please go on mute if you're not speaking and you shouldn't be unless you're kidding right now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, reasons to have a will. Well, a will specifies what you wish to happen to your property as um, as you passed, right? Um, you name your beneficiaries, and I would suggest um, naming a second person to that um, beneficiary, just because, I mean, as a person to receive any um, gifts in case that first beneficiary is no longer around or if they um, refuse to take the property. And the reason why a, re a beneficiary may refuse the property um, could be a host of reasons, right? But like, how dare I get just such a little amount? <laughs> but besides that, when you're really thinking about um, your assets and you really have maybe a good amount of wealth that you want to protect and pass down. Um, some people are some children who are really near to do or doing very well from them for themselves may not take that gift because um, it brings them above the New York state or the federal estate tax exemptions. And now they're in this tax bracket, they're, they're going to be hit with such a load of tax, right? So it's just not worth taking that amount of money. And if the plan is structured very well, if that child refuses the amount that's coming from you as a parent, you could take that amount, refuse, and possibly have it go down to your children, right? Um, your child's um, ch children or your great grandchildren, right? So you could have it go down the line. So there's also the option to refuse. So who should you name as the successors to those, right? Your children or your grandchildren more than likely. If you're doing a, like a complex plan, there's, it's so creative. You could structure almost anywhere, anyhow you want. Um, another reason to have a will is that you could specify your funeral, your funeral wish, wishes, which, um, you know, it's good to put that information in your will, but I would really recommend that you do a separate document. And this could call, to be called like a burial designation um, form. And there are a host of different um, forms that there have, but in this form, you, be, you basically instruct the person you appoint as agent over um, your remains, whether, and you instruct them whether you want to be cremated or whether you want it to be buried and what location, maybe you've um, already bought a, a burial plot. And so you want to designate, you know, that person and let them know that information. So you would put that in the form. And the reason why I recommend um, doing it as a separate form instead of within your will is because there are times where you've been buried and then your will is right after with the family all gathered and, you know, and, and have a moment to settle down. But now we're reading the will and that's not the burial instruction you wanted. And that could be very disappointing for your family members and of course for you, even though that you're no longer here with us, but it can and it defeats the purpose. So always put that in a separate document. And 
a reason um, to have a will also is that you can appoint an executor and a successor executor to um, wrap up your affairs. Um, this would include paying off bills, canceling your credit cards, and notifying the banks and other um, establishment of your passing and that your estate will either be going through probate. We'll discuss the, the three types of proceedings um, in the next few slides. And you know, you want to let them know that they've passed away and here's what's going to be happening. And almost all of them are equipped to handle situations like these. And as I mentioned, um, you know, you could change this anytime you want. And you also have the benefit of maybe disinheriting an individual who would otherwise inherit um, under your estate if you died without leaving a will. Um, when you speak to your attorney, there are things that come up to mind here. So can you really disinherit a spouse in New York? No, you cannot right? There are all these right of election that your spouse has. And, you know, the, the you would need to go through with an attorney, like the different, um, the different ways in order for you to actually disinherit your spouse. One way is if both pair, um, both spouses um, sign a waiver of consent form. And with that form, it's basically saying, I waive my New York State um, uh, rights of elections against my, my spouse's estate. The right of election mean you have a right to take assets from your, what, your spouse's estate, right? So the spouse could waive that right, and so can the, the husband waive that right. And so that's one way. Um, another host of events could be, you know, maybe the marriage has become, um, you know, it's broken apart um, for whatever reason. Maybe there's a separation agreement. Maybe the spouse have abandoned one another. And so, you know, there's there's no right of election at this moment, but it's very um, case specific. And this is why I'm saying it would be better to really speak with an attorney to like get all the scenarios out and then to match it to see how the law really complies, you know, during that time. Okay, so we discussed what a will is and, you know, when you have a will, it's good, we go through probate court, but what if you died without leaving a valid will behind? Well, what happens, right? What happens with all your assets? Um, maybe you're just gonna get around to it and just that last moment, right? That's how it happens all the time. Well, New York has written a plan for you and you'll see it on the side here. We'll discuss it in a moment, but when a, a person dies intestate, and that means without a will, that person's property is distributed according to law. And in New York law, for those who are curious, I put this, the statute there is called Estates, Powers, Trusts, Law, section 4-1.1 that you could quickly look up. Of course, you'll get this chart and you'll be able to go through it. And who, who gets what will depend on two things, right? Who are your relatives and how close are they to you in that group of people? And just one word to mention that, say the court has gone through all the lists to find the last person that is there, alive in your family to receive your assets, right? If they can find no one, they can't find your spouse, your children, your parents, your grandparents, your uncles, aunts, there's no one to take. What happens to the money? Well, it, it cheats and it goes to New York State. And I've put the website here where you could um, take a look and you could search 
your own name, which is kind of fun fact to do, and those of your loved ones, just to see if there's anything out there. And um, we're not going to get into it now, but if you're, you do find your name or your relative's name, you could go through the process of you know, trying to claim those funds as a relative and the website will give you the instructions that you would need to actually go through. For example, like if the, the person is a decedent and they went through surrogate's court, now the executor has, you know, a certificate from the court that basically says this person's authorized to act for the estate. And so um, you get that paper, the death certificate, and you will fill out the forms that the New York State Controller's Office um, will give you. And some of those things that you'll have to add is like the death certificate and maybe the cert, the certificate, whatever they ask, you'll provide it and you will be able to access those funds. So here's a quick breakdown of how um, New York State would um, would break your, pop, your property apart if you died without a will. So first, um, they will look to see if you have a spouse. If you have no spouse, um, and spouses just means husband or wife. Um, so a spouse and, and, and children are no children. The spouse inherits everything, right? That's it, the box stops there. If you have a spouse, everything goes to the spouse. If you have a child, if you have children but no spouse, then the children gets everything and the box stops there. But how about when you have a spouse and children, which is a lovely position to be in, right? You want them to be around. Um, well, the spouse will receive the first $50,000. So here's the assets, right? The spouse receives $50,000, you take it off the top, and then whatever is remaining is what you'll give half to the spouse of the remainder, and then the rest would be shared by the children. And if you have two children, of, of course, they'll split that half, right? Um, and after you have done that, that's how you would split between the spouse and children. There's also exempt property that the spouse will receive, such as, you know, a certain portion of the other spouse's jewelry, the other spouse's clothing, and also the other, other spouse's um, automobile, automobile. So maybe there was a car driven by the family. It may belong to the spouse if it's probably below $25,000 or less, right? You have to look at the circumstances is there. But let's get rid of spouses and children. Let's pretend there are no spouse and no children. Well, who will the state look to then? Well, first, they're going to look for your parents. Are any of your parents alive? And you have two parents, right? So you have mom and you have dad and dad has his own family and mom has um, her own family and they're the sisters that bind you all, sisters and brothers that bind you all together. So first they'll look for parents and the buck will stop there. But if no parents, then you need to look for your siblings. And what if a sibling has predeceased, but they have children, right? Um, then you look for those children and it will just keep on going down the line to your siblings, your brothers. And from there comes your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, your, your cousins, right? And there's an asterisk place here because I just wanted you to be aware that if a child dies, say for example you have passed away you had three children so now your your assets are going to be split three ways right with the one third going to each child what if one of your child also passed away and they passed away before you did and they have two other children well that share that actually belong to that child that that's now predeceased will go to his or her children, your grandchildren, and then that goes on down the line. So there's a plan for that as well. And here we've come to part two, 
which will discuss the surrogate's court process. And in this section, we'll just discuss um, the three main proceedings um, in the surrogate's court process. Of course, there are many other proceedings that we could get into, but because it's not quite relevant unless a specific event um, really necessitated, necessitated that you actually worked with, say, the accounting department or the miscellaneous department, because, for example, you have relatives that um, are listed in the will, but it's been over 20 years and no one has seen Sister Jane or know if she's alive or had children. So now we're searching for an, an unknown distributee, right? We have no idea where they are. Now we need publication. We need site Citation. Those are different documents and really in-depth things that we would need to get into. And this is not the first part when the, the person really just dies, right? So this will focus on the three main types of the small estate. Um, small estate probate when you have a will and administration proceeding when you don't have a will. And a small estate really covers when you have a will, and when you don't. The reason it's called a small estate is because the decedent may have died with so little that it's really not necessary to go through the court and the hubaloo to get everything done. There's a simpler way, a simpler process that um, the state has provided here. And so here are the, the types of estate proceeding. Uh, you'll have a small estate, and this estate is also called a voluntary administration is because you really don't have to. If the estate is really um, less than $50,000, you really don't need to administer the estate. So um, the $50,000 though, if you'll see next to it, it says worth of personal property. And the reason why I gave those definitions in the beginning is because it really becomes important here when you read the law and kind of decipher what it means and if it actually applies to you. So less than $50,000 worth of personal property, not real property, right? Which is different, which is the house and the land. Personal property, we're talking about jewelry, stocks and other investments. So you could have $50,000 worth of personal property and real property only if that real property property is jointly owned. And that's um, color coded only because it's really, really important too. Even though the words look very simple, it means that you could have the real property, but it must be jointly owned. It must have a designation form that basically says, John Doe has just died. He owned this real estate with Jane Doe jointly. The, case, the state no longer cares because the form basically said John, Jane Doe now owns the property because it's going to her jointly. So really that real property is not being administered by the court at all. And that's why they're saying it, right? That you can have it, but it has to be jointly owned um, and it passes straight to um, to the surviving joint tenant. And this proceeding is very simple. It's inexpensive and currently cost about a dollar to begin this proceeding. And you can also do it online, which is very cool. So you could just go onto the court's website and it'll have a do it yourself um, program that you can just, um, you know, link into and fill out the application, um, possibly upload the death certificate where necessary. And I'm not sure if they will require you to send in an original. That's what the courts are doing now. Even if you're able to file online, you still have to send the death certificate. And if you have a will, in that case, it must be sent to the, co the court within two days. So, but um, it's sure, I'm sure it's a very simple process and they'll walk you through and let you know. And so the second type of probate is where um, if a person dies with a will, 
then this kind of proceeding will be called um, probate and the property will be decided, um, divided according to what the will states and the court will have jurisdiction over all these assets and making sure that your fiduciaries are held responsible, right? It's not like you could just get appointed by the court and then let the property go to waste. You have a job to do and that jobs come with a fiduciary status with ha which has liabilities and liabilities in the way of um, maybe you've stolen or let assets just lie and now you're responsible for funding back those money that you basically have lost because you weren't paying attention or just didn't care, right? So it's a job and you want to choose someone that's responsible and they will do the right thing. And no one is saying that the person you chose, because obviously, like say, for example, you chose your mother, right? Maybe she doesn't have the, the, the legal uh, legal lease and the technicality to like really deal with all of these, then that person has authority to hire, you know, an, uh, an attorney that may be able to help them through this process or speak with someone else. And basically when you're drafting the will, like those really dense portion that no one really reads through will say that the fiduciary has the power to delegate their authority in order to get the job done, right? And that will be an important section in your will. And so the administration proceeding, basically this is the same proceeding as the probate proceeding. Um, the only difference is that now you don't have a will, right? So the estate is being distributed and divided the way that the law has designated. And I just put a quick um, note here. So if the decedent at the top has a less than 50,000 of personal property, um, and it may include real property that is jointly owned, um, then file for a small estate proceeding, which is only a dollar right? Go through that process instead. But what if the decedent died and had a will? Then that will go through probate. Well, had a will and it's above $50,000, right? They could go through probate. And what if they died but didn't have a will and it's over $50,000? Go for administration. And just a word about the appointment of an executor or administrator within the surrogates court. This is a very um, important role as we described before. I think I've em emphasized that enough, I think. <laughs> but executors are named by the deceased person in a will and are appointed by the court. So yeah, you could name them in your will. I want um, Jane Doe as my will, as my executor or, um, you know, our trustee, if you build a trust in your will. But really now we're in court and we filed all the right documents. We have crossed our RTs and we have dotted our I's and now it's presented to the court. What, and the court has decided, hmm, Jane Doe doesn't seem to be qualified, right? And so we're no longer naming her. So you should name a successor person just um, in case, right? Or maybe Jane Doe is by the time, you know, you pass, Jane Doe is no longer competent in order to, to really do the job. So you need to be flexible there. And one way to build flexibility is main, naming a successor or two. And there are some questions that will come up about, well, what if I don't have a competent person? What if everyone's too young or too old? Or what if I really don't know anyone or trust anyone? Well, could a, uh, a church member be used? Could someone from an organization that really caters to um, maybe helping out or giving pro bono services? Could you name a bank? Um, that only becomes tricky because some banks want um, a certain limitation in assets 
in order to take the job on. They want to make sure it's worthwhile, right? Because while um, some people don't pay their executors or administrators, they are entitled to commission by state, but they could waive the payment, especially when a beneficiary is named or a spouse. It's like you're giving them everything, right? So if they're taking a payment for the service of wrapping up the estate and distributing those funds to themselves, well, well, they're really taking from their own pocket, right? So it doesn't become um, quite an issue there sometimes. But if you're naming a bank as a fiduciary, they are, they're going to be looking to get paid and they want to make sure that the estate is worth it. And worth it mean the value of the estate is so much, right? Whatever their cutoff is. And the qualification in New York to become a administrator or an executor, well, first, you can't be a felon, you can't be an infant, and you can't be in incapacitated, mm -hmm. and you can't be a non-domiciliary alien either, because um, basically you have no standing. The court can't really reach, say, into um, St. Croix or maybe Jamaica or the Barbados, different places in order to reach to grab that person and make them responsible and liable for those assets. The court's jurisdiction doesn't, our arm doesn't extend that long. And so this is why the court has limited to these um, individuals, right? If you're incapacitated or infant or, well, if you're a felon, you're not trustworthy. If you're an infant or incapacitated, well, you're not qualified because you don't have the wear it in order to do it. And if you're non-domicile, well, we can't hold you. We appoint you and now you've stolen all the decedent's assets. How am I supposed to really reach you and put you in jail, right? You're somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So these are really the reasons why. And I placed the code there for you if you just wanted to look it up at a later time. And the probate court, um, the probate process really begins with first filing a will if there is a will right? So the two main, main documents is the will and a, an original debt certificate, right? Must be filed. If it's an administration proceeding, obviously there will be no will because the decedent died in test state, right? But the court still require you to give in an original debt certificate and also a paid funeral bill will be needed. And of the both forms, administration or executor, you'll need to file notices, waivers and consents. And all these forms that I'm talking about is really on the New York State Surrogates Court website. So you can find all these forms and all this information there. And I would really like say, for example, I had an issue and there's a death in my family and now I'm named. I would really want to know what I'm getting into. Right. So I would just want to visit like the probate website on the New York court and just go through um, the process and the forms, because it just basically give you a nice little blurb to say, here are the forms that you would need and here's what they do. And that would keep you knowledgeable for when you sit with your attorney and you know a little bit of something, right? Because this may be so overwhelming for you during that time with the death of a family member, the overwhelmness that you would be feeling at that time and having to go through all the paperwork, the mail to find everything. Um, it's a lot. And so um, these forms can be found there and it may help you to structure your mind before you sit, you know, with an attorney. But once these um, forms have been filed, the next step would be to go um, the court the court finds everything valid, right? The will is valid. They went through the administration proceeding where there was no will. And yes, these are the people who are the beneficiaries, yeah. right? Three people on Zoom, right? Is it Calvary? 
and and so um, there I would be two letters testamentary or letters of administration. So there are two types, and those two types of letters is basically depends on the type of proceeding you went to. And once the the administrator or the test the the um, the executor. Um, has this information, they'll be ready to go to the banks to open up a bank account, which would be in the name of the estate. They could now take those checks that may be coming from their last, last employment check, check, maybe it's a retirement check, anywhere, right? They will have the ability to now place that, that um, check into that bank account in the name of the decedent. But there is no way for you to do that unless you had that letter that that stated, you know, here are um, here's my authority to open the the bank account in the name of this estate, right? And you can make sales of property. You could distribute the assets. Um, and this process could take a lengthy time, right? Even for the court get to you, it could take six months to a year. Um, the Westchester Court has been. Um, been trying their best to get through as fast as they can, but um, their turnaround could be like two months to even get a temporary letter. Other turnarounds, for example, like in the Bronx, we have an accounting going and the court we filed in um, November of last year and the court is doing between September and like October so it's like a whole process ours is in the line and you know there's stacks of cases to go through and that's just because of COVID and also um, a lot of people have felt the brunt of that and our um, people have died and have not been able to refill the position. So I think it's not only the courts that are experiencing this kind of overwhelming loss and trying to recoup and doing the best they can. But um, unfortunately, the backlog extends to, to us as practitioners wow. and to you as you know the clients who are trying to move ahead as quickly as they can. Now, Katie, I have a question for you about um, the executor. Can an executor also be a beneficiary in the will? Right, that's a really, really good question. And I'm going to answer it in two parts. And the first part is a yes. A beneficiary can definitely be um, an executor or a trustee in a will. And that's how usually wills are drafted. The, the executor would be the spouse first. And the, if the spouse, say, have died or too elderly at this time, then the successor would be my children acting jointly or maybe Bob first. And then if Bob can't act, then it could be Jane. So definitely a beneficiary can act and the beneficiary could be a friend that you wish to make a, a, a cash request to. Yes, it can be. The second part is that um, that's a really good question because a beneficiary who's also a distributee, who is also a spouse, who's also a child, who's even the friend who's getting, um, you know, property within that will. We do not want that person to be a witness to signing the will. And the reason why we don't want that beneficiary to, to be a witness signing the will is that now you're in the, the same room as the person signed in the will, how do I know that you didn't unduly influence that person to give you half their estate, right? It's like, you, it's, it just has that, that, you know, like that fishy smell. And so the court need to clear the air whenever something like that happens. And that's why most attorneys will not have a beneficiary sign. The will where they're becoming where they're receiving a, a gift um, yeah this, thank you thank you that's I, I wanted to clear that up um, 
you know, we are, let's see, we have probably about 10 to 15 minutes left. Um, okay. I can get through. And we're, yeah, we're not quite halfway through, but, um, you know, this is really great information. I, I hope um, that, I didn't mention this before, but this deck will be available. So if you've been taking notes, you can stop because this deck will be available to you. Um, we will make sure that you have access to that and we'll give you um, Ms. Wong's uh, contact information as well. So, you know, if there are follow up questions, you can uh, ask her directly. All right. Thank you. <laughs> And so we're at part three and you'll see at um, the right side, we'll be discussing trust and then what to include, the alternatives and then the financial um, needs. Excuse me. So trust. So a trust also is a written agreement between two parties. And as I mentioned before, a settler is also known as the grantor, and this is the person who's creating the trust, funding the trust. And the second very important person you'll need is the trustee, as we described below. And this kind of covers like the four main components of setting up the trust, which is where you will have the settler, the trustee, the trust fund we discussed, which will be broken up into income and principal. And then we'll also have the beneficiary, right? So you did all this great planning. Who will be the person receiving the assets, right? And there, the next page we'll discuss, well, do you want to give the beneficiary everything? Or should you hold some for a little bit? Maybe they're too young now. Maybe you should set the, the time frame differently, right? So there are really two main types of trust. There's a trust that you create when you're living and there's a trust that you create when you die. And that trust is basically in your will. Your will will say, um, give everything to Sister Jane and the rest, I really want you to create a trust and put it in for my children, my grandchildren and great grandchildren, right? So a living trust, and a testamentary trust. So a living trust, you could have two types, right? During that time, it could be a revocable trust. And with this trust, when you set it up, you have control over the assets. You're able to go in to tinker with the beneficiary. Maybe I don't want this beneficiary to have one third. Maybe you should have one half. Maybe now I would like to give my furniture to Sister Carol. Let me do that instead, right? So you have control. But if you create an irrevocable trust, right, during your life, this is where you've given control to someone else. It's irrevocable. You may no longer change the term of that trust. And obviously, a testamentary trust is going to be irrevocable because you're dead and you can't revoke it anymore, right? So that goes with that. And here are some commonly used trusts that um, we can discuss. You'll have your supplemental needs trust, and this is basically um, for a beneficiary under disability. Maybe your parents are becoming elderly. Maybe you're thinking about um, creating, um, you know, and structuring their assets so they may qualify for Medicaid. So you could possibly take their assets out and have them create a supplemental needs trust or create a supplemental needs trust for your, um, by yourself in your plan in order to help benefit what they would be receiving from Medicaid, right? So it's a supplemental needs, you give extra. Um, to them. You could also create a marital trust, which is only for spouses, and there are quite a lot of reglements that you need to make sure that are dear and are required, like all income must go to the spouse in a marital trust. You could create a family um, trust, which could be for spouse and children and others as well. And a generational trust really speaks about grandchildren and your other descendants. And so how to send money really down the line and delay the taxes as you go. And in discussing the marital trust, well, if your spouse is not a US citizen, you can't really create a marital trust for that person. You would need to create a QDOT 
and in a queue that basically the amount to be sheltered is less, but that that's the type of trust you would need. You could also create a business trust that may hold LLC interests and voting rights. You may also, um, you know, have trust that does partnership agreements that does other things within those business trusts. You also have charitable trust um, for making gifts to charity and also life insurance trust, which is really important. If you have such an asset, you may want to consider, because here's what happens, and it's important to spend at least a minute on it. If you have a life insurance, once you die, that life insurance, if it has no designation, basically goes into your estate. And now you may have a dollar $50,000, let's use that for the small estate. But now the life insurance is over $2 million, right? So now your, your estate is $2 million, $2 million 50, right? So now you really need to pay taxes. Well, you wouldn't have to because of the, the exemption, but there could be taxes there. But if you change the name on your life insurance and transfer it to a trust, say Jane Doe's trust, right? Now you're taking that life insurance out of your estate, right? It's no longer in your name, so it doesn't belong to you. So now you only have that $50,000 in your estate and you could do the small proceeding. And now you have the 2 million in your trust and you designate who goes, uh, where those assets goes, right? So it reduces the expensive of expenses of administering your estate, get it out of your probate estate, and it reduces your federal, your federal taxes. And so trust. So after deciding when to create your trust, whether during your life, right, uh, irrevocable trust or irrevo irrevocable trust, and whether to make the trust um, revocable or not, you will need to decide what assets you want to hold in there. Is the trust the whole life insurance proceeds, like we talked, 401ks, other pensions? What about real property, um, LLC interest? Um, maybe you have a small solo practice. Should you put those interests within a trust as an added layer of protection? How about stocks and other investments? Do you have cryptocurrencies such as as Bitcoin and other assets that use blockchain technology, such as non-fungible tokens, NFT, how are you going to manage those assets? Those are really important because not many people understand them, but say you open up a cryptocurrency and you have a wallet and it's going well, you know the passwords and everything, but now you've died. How are your family to access those? If they do not find that piece of paper, that asset is gone, completely gone, right? So you need to build in a way in order for your, your beneficiaries and your executor to access those assets, right? So think very carefully about those. And what will be the purpose of your trust? Well, is the trust as we discussed for the benefit of, benefit of a spouse? You really wanna think, well, is it gonna be a marital trust? Is it gonna be a qualified domestic trust um, for non-citizen spouses, right? Is the trust for your spouse or your children or your great-grandchildren? How should you um, decide to give the, the beneficiaries their assets? Should it just be income? right? The, prop, the, the income that's generated from the property you put in, right? Do you want them to have access to that? So those are all plans that you would um, go through with your attorney or just sitting down and tr really trying to structure out. I'm putting all this money in the trust and now it's protected. But in the end, what do I want to happen to it? There's the money I put in, the sole money, and then the money that is being earned. How, what should it go? How should it go? Should it all go to spouse? Should it then go to children? You know, it's as creative as you can be. And then part four, what's included in your will or trust? So consider, like I said, everything you currently own and may own in the future. Any tangible assets you have, such as your jewelry, your book, your art, clothing, any real property and um, co-ops are not considered real property because you have a stock agreement. So really it's like, you know, 
tend te property, right? Tangible property. So that too, you can still make a designation of who should receive those assets. So your real property, your co-ops, your condominiums, those things. Consider anything you may receive from your insurance proceed, from your pensions, your IRAs, your 401ks. Consider all your assets that you have, right? And then the second, you decide who you would like to benefit your assets. So make a list of your beneficiaries right? These are all my assets. And these are all the people who have been thinking about. And really, really, the guy that does my garbage has been so awesome. I really, really want to like bequeath just a little cash request to him. Write his name down and put the amount that you want, because these are all the components that are going to be going into your will. And that's why I said it's like the nuts and bolts of your estate plan, because it's what you want it to be. And then after after you do that, right, you have your asset, you list your beneficiaries, I just want you to go one step further and consider who else would you like to benefit if one or, or all the people you like to die, like it's a morbid profession to go through, but we you know, basically you X off people until you get to where you need to, right? So your first beneficiaries, what if they're not there? What if they predecease you? What if they refuse? Well, who else would you like to give? that gift to that's important to add a successor the third thing is decide how you would like to share assets amongst your beneficiaries fourth think about um, who would like who you would like to break up an impasse if the beneficiaries can't agree and we discuss fiduciaries and just thinking about the specific instructions that you really want to leave behind such as your burial rights guardians for minor children, which is super important. So list all of those that you want to inherit from your estate and to have some control over the loved ones you're leaving behind. And seven, just think about what you would like to happen to any assets you had not accounted for because either you oh, you just had no idea you owned it. Maybe you had joined, um, you know, Gerber when the babies were like five, right? And then you totally forgot that you had the plan and, you know, somehow it, it, it comes to you and you just totally forgot about that. Or thinking about like, a great aunt that oh you don't even know that you have this great aunt and now she's left a fortune because she had no will and you're the last person to take you just never know so these are your residuary estates right your residuary just mean what's left behind what's the residue who would you like those assets to go to very important, right? So we gave away the jewelry, we gave away the car, we gave some cash requests here. Yes, we gave some to charity as well. Now here's the remainder. What should I do with it, right? Name the first person and then the second person. And part five, well, what if you just don't want to go through creating a will or a trust, right? What can you do? Well, as we discussed before, you could name a benefit name beneficiaries on your designation forms. And the way that you would do this, say you have a Chase Bank account or Bank of America, you call those, um, those um, institutions and you basically say, I have an account here. I would like to designate a beneficiary, which you should have done when you first opened the account. Is that person your spouse? Is that person um, your children? Is it your aunt? Who did you list on those forms? In what percentages did you give 100% to your aunt? Would you rather give 50% and then 25 to uncle and then 25 to cousin? You know, like, do you still want it? To do that. So if you actually went through and structure those forms and give the assets the way that you would like to, then those assets are not going to go in your trust. They're not going to go in your will. And the court, court the surrogates court have no control over those assets anymore. They would just go, as you simply said, on the, that form, 50% to Aunt Jane, then 25 to cousin and 25 to uncle, right? The other thing that you could do is title real property in the name of those you intend to receive the property. But I just put like a little B 
be wary sign there because there are things that could happen, right? There's consequences and the three that major ones that I can think of, right? So you retitled your name in the name of a second, ben a second person. So now it's you and John that owns the property. So be wary of, of John selling or assigning his interest in the property to someone else, right? For something, give me this car and eventually down the line, I'm gonna own this one half in this property and I wanna give it to you for the car in 2020, even though the property could be 30 years from now, right? They're assigning their interests. Um, I don't think that's what you're intended. Be wary of that. There's also gift tax consequences in naming additional persons to title. So for example, um, you named John. Now it seems like you gave John half that property as a gift. So say the property was $200,000. Now you gave John a $100,000 gift. Guess what? Now it's outside of the gift tax, right? Is the gift tax is $16,000 that you could give to a person free without tax, right? So the other portion is going to now count against your estate taxes that you have and lower that amount. So there are gift tax consequences to that. There's also a loss of some step up in basis on the date of debt for the value. Basically, say you, um, you bought the property for $50,000. Now you have died in 22 and the property is worth um, $200,000. Well, really there's a gain on that property of $150,000, right? And you're gonna pay um, taxes based on that. Well, when you die and your beneficiary um, received that property, if you, um, bequeathed that property, devised that property to the beneficiary, well, they'll take the $50,000 that you originally bought the property, and then that becomes their basis. So when the beneficiary go to sell the property, instead of selling a $200,000 house, they'll be selling it with a new basis, but you could lose that when you actually retitle the property, right, and not wait for that for that to yeah. happen. So these are the three main ones that would really need to be flushed out and well thought out before taking this alternative to creating a will and trust. So there's a beneficiary designation form, which you can do right now, including your IRA accounts, right? You could name someone to receive your IRA accounts, your, your pensions, your 401ks, and those assets just go immediately to those people. You know, actually, Katie, and before we go to the um, the next slide, I had a question about the beneficiary designation forms, which I think is an excellent way for people to um, certainly transfer assets. Uh, but what if that conflicts with what's in the will? Which of really the documents would, would trump? Oh, that's really good. That's very good. So... My will basically says I really want to give, um, you know, fifty thousand dollars to in fifty thousand dollars in my Chase bank account, and I keep using Chase because it's just so easy. Um, but fifty thousand dollars in my Chase account should go to my brother. But then when I go to Chase, it says on the form, fifty thousand dollars goes to my sister what will Chase do, right? They're at an impasse. One thing says one thing and right. the other. Well, the form, the designation form with Chase okay. controls okay. Not your will or your trust, if your trust said such a thing. It, that doesn't work. That was a great question. Great. Yeah. Thank you. So now we've come to financial and healthcare directives. And in thinking about financial and healthcare directives, um, really is just preparing yourself for not exactly, sorry, not exactly what must happen, but what could happen, right? Everything is going well, everyone's happy, including myself, and I have all these wonderful plans, and, you know, sometimes 
man plan and God wipes our plan differently and just have something great around the store in store for us, right? But we just never know. And so planning for incapacity is not to say that this will happen, it's just in case it happens. And if case in case I become so incapacitated that I'm in life, um, in the hospital on life support, what can I do? Who will help me? Who would make the financial decisions for me? Who will go to the bank? to make sure this is paid or this is on time. So it's just really a good plan that ensures that should something happen to you, your wishes will be protected as well as make sure someone will have the legal authority to, um, to represent you because say you don't have a spouse or children, well, can your friend really act for you? Well, no, no, right? So you really, really want to have like a healthcare proxy, which we'll get into, and also a financial directive, which is a power of attorney. And the living will also will discuss and that um, basically um, tell the doctors what you would like happen or not. So a power of attorney may be for personal or business use, right? And that's important too. If you have a, a private practice, an LLC, um, you could have a power of attorney over that as well. Or it could be, um, you know, for business or personal, sorry, as I mentioned. And a power of attorney names an agent to manage your financial affairs if you could become incapacitated. And here to also consider, consider naming co-agents and successor agents, just in case the first person can't act, but also just because they could also play as protectors for each others, right? I won't want to do anything if I have John looking over my shoulder, right? I'll make mm -hmm. sure I walk the line very straight. And so the power of attorney may be revoked at any time. And that's very important. And you want to remember that, that, and the way that you revoke that is basically taking the form up and ripping it. And you can ask the person back for that form because you're going to be executing a new one and rip that up. But you also want to go to a step further and call the institutions that may have relied on um, that power of, of attorney and to say it's no longer in effect like let the banks know who because this person might go and still draw out your money right so let them know that you cancel it you revoked it it's no longer in action right and uh, um it's important to note too that the power of attorney ceases once you die and then there's the healthcare proxy, right? And this just names someone, as I mentioned, for your medical decision. Key components to this one is that you can only name one person at a time. A lot of people want to name both their children because sometimes it feels bad. Like my daughter thinks that I trust this person more, you know? So there's a lot of things like that, but just be mindful that the state have also thought of that and the hospitals have also thought of that. And so if sister is saying yes and brother is saying no, what is the poor doctor to do, right? And so this is the reason why only one person can be named on your healthcare proxy at a time. That that does not mean that you can't name a successor, which you do want to do. So name first sister, if she's the most responsible, and then name brother to take our third person, your third son, for an after. Like I said, a power of attorney, you could name all three, a healthcare proxy, one at a time. And a living will really just goes along with your healthcare proxy and the two documents could also be defined, um, uh, combined. And so in your living will, you provide instructions to your healthcare agent regarding how you prefer to be treated during a time you're incapacitated, if you're on life support. Um, it discusses paid medications, nutrition, and fluids. And it also gives instruction to withdraw treatment and other fluids 
um, if it if it only seeks to prolong your life when you're really in a vegetative vegetative state and like so terminally ill that there's really no chance that you will come back to like really be. And so in that critical moment, do you really want like food just to sustain yourself on pain medication, tubes, breathing? So those are like really, really personal decisions that you'll want to make in a living will and just to have those inf um, information handy to your agent so they know it and you communicate that to them they let them know even without the form what you want to happen right and a HIPAA form the healthcare insurance portability act I'm sure you have all heard of that it really just gives your loved one the information that they need from the doctor's office so in this form you basically list the people that you want to have have your healthcare instruction. And it can quite be frustrating when, you know, you're really in a bind and you need your daughter or son to, or maybe your neighbor who's always been there for you to go and pick up your healthcare information in order to get something done and they're unable to do that. So this form really helps with that. And I wanted to quickly just, we burial directives, we discussed at length to do it as in a separate form. And this is just important about the best practices for healthcare directives during surrogacy. And I just wanna quickly mention because the way that our society is going now, it's really important to, to plan for these these um, these types of situation where someone is no long are no longer are in the beginning was unable to have a child of their own, but they really do want to have a child, right? And so do their husband. Well, could someone be an in intended parent for them and carry that child, right? Well, there's going to be an agreement in that situation, and the agreement may specify health. Um, health information, right. And so a surrogate mother should really consider authorizing and directing an agent to discuss medical decisions with the intended parent and with their doctors, and to also to follow the provisions of the surrogacy agreement, right. And this may include directions to take all measures to keep the surrogate child alive if the pregnancy is still viable for, for a situation which like like I said, it could be a really, really morbid topic, but say, God forbid, like in car accident and, you know, the, mo the mother's in critical state, but the baby can be saved. What does the doctor do in that situation? And what does your agent do in that situation? They should really look back at that surrogacy agreement with that in intended parent to make sure they're making the right decision, right? Absolutely, yeah. And now we have come to an end and I wanted to just quickly mention about New York estate taxes, the federal estate taxes and the gift tax. And New York does um, have a basic exclusion for 2022. You can basically give $6,110,000 away without having an estate tax, which is awesome. And for federal taxes, you can give away um, over 12 million if um, you have that much to give. I don't, and I hope to get there, but I don't have right now. <laughs> but you can give. And guess what? That amount is doubled once you're married and you can give that away. And so for the gift tax return, we also um, discussed that you could give about um, $16,000 away free um, without incurring um, additional gift tax. And so you gave um, 20,000 away, the $16,000 will be free, but that extra $4,000 that is not free and will be taxed will now go against the New York um, taxes, the 6 million. And now we're taking, the government is taking 4 million away from that six. Now you're only left with two to give away, right? So that's how that would balance out. So while doing your estate plan, your lawyer should really, really be taking into New York estate tax and federal estate tax to make your, make your plan work as you really need it. I have to say it was really pleasure, really a great pleasure to like speak 
speak with you tonight, to have the opportunity to, to join you, for you to listen in. And I hope you really did find something valuable from this presentation and that it actually helped you to structure your mind about, you know, what you should be doing and how you should be doing it. And it's super creative. You could do almost anything you want. So don't be afraid. <laughs> okay, just get your mind situated about how you would like it to be done and find an attorney to help you draft it out and make sure that is exactly what you want to do. And thank you again. And thank you so, so much for joining us this evening. Um, this was just a wealth of information, very timely, very helpful. Um, we are going to, um, I think, see if we can get the presentation into the chat uh, so that people can download it and then it will also be available um, uh, via YouTube so people can watch this presentation later and I'm going to go ahead and, and take the liberty of inviting you to come back with us again uh, and in, in share additional information and we really do appreciate all the time that you spent preparing and delivering uh, this presentation today. Um, thank so you, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to just thank you, Kadim L. Wong Esquire, for bringing us this excellent presentation. It was detailed and informative. It was desperately needed and on time. You created a sense of urgency in each and every one of us. As 1 Timothy 6 says, we, are brought, we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out with us. So we must choose our last acts of kindness that can be carried on once we're gone. Judy Bartlett Esquire, one of our own Greenberg residents, we love you. Thank you for bringing this wonderful lady and role model to us. She was dynamic, transformative. She was Absolutely. unforgettable. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Carmen Guy, risk manager for your partnership and for manning the Zoom. We appreciate you. I want to take this time to thank Dr. Sean Dowdy, our pastor, and our AY department for all their support. I would like to thank all the participants, 53 strong participants. I thank you for coming on. Finally, I want to acknowledge the presence of Councilman Ken Jones, Greenberg Town Board member. We appreciate you being on this presentation. Thank you. Thank to each and every one of you for coming and may God bless you all. We thank you. I will now ask our dear sister Vivian Phillips to do our closing prayer. Thank you so much, everyone. Saying I've been through a number of these situations and this information is absolutely crucial and please look for the recording of this and go over it again. Let's bow our heads to prayer. Our Father and our God, we're so grateful for your workings in our lives. Sometimes we avoid uh, dealing with the subject of death, but Lord, we have to prepare. Thank you for this information that we have gotten. Help us to use it, and Lord, help us to be empowered, to be prepared for whatever will happen in our lives. We ask that you will continue to bless us, strengthen us, and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.